Welcome to a short presentation on resilience. So what is resilience? Well, here's a couple of definitions. This is from the American Psychological Association, which defines resilience as a process of adapting well in the face of adversity. And the adversity can come from a wide range of different sources, family, relationships, health, workplace or finance. And here's a definition from Professor Michael Neenan that Resilience is a flexible, a set of flexible responses to acute and chronic adversity, and that these flexible responses can be learned and are within the grasp of everyone. And one of the most important factors contributing to resilience is the attitude of the person. And I really want to emphasize resilience is not bouncing back, however much pop psychology may say that. Because there's obviously some traumatic and horrible situations and that you're not going to bounce back from. However, you might adapt well and adapt flexibly over time. But resilience is not about bouncing back. So Bonanno and colleagues have studied pathways from adversity. Uh, let's say your, your life's going along OK. And then a, a bad event, a really unwanted situation or event happens to a person there's a couple of pathways from this there's just being resilient and adapting well in the face of this event some people become perhaps quite disturbed and thrown off course and gradually recover to their previous level of functioning some people become unwell and stay unwell for several months or years you know, for instance post-traumatic stress reactions can be an example of chronic dysfunction that some people unfortunately experience as a result of traumatic events. And there's also a phenomena called post-traumatic growth, where the person certainly wouldn't wish the event on other people, but nevertheless, they experience some growth after the adverse event. And I've certainly worked with people, for instance, who have had heart attacks, who get to really change their philosophy and their life as a result of the heart attack. And so that could be considered sometimes post-traumatic growth. But the most common human reaction to unwanted event is resilience because human beings are very resilient organisms. And it's important to emphasize as well that resilience doesn't just come from what's inside you. Now there are things inside you, internal factors that do make a difference and that you can work on, but we don't want to get into victim blaming here because there are things outside of an individual which also influence their ability to adapt and withstand unwanted events. Whether they have a job, whether the job is a good job, friends and connections, connections within the community, how much money people have, do they have buffers, is their housing secure? So we don't want to say that resilience is entirely related to individual factors. It's also influenced by things outside the individual. Now, one of the things that seems to make a difference to how well people react to adversity is called the explanatory style. Because human beings vary in how we explain the cause of bad things. So let's say you've started work and your boss throws down a report and in front of other people says, this report is rubbish. You should be embarrassed by yourself. Jeez, where do we get these people from? And says that in front of other people. Now, we vary in how we explain negative things according to perhaps three different axes. Internal versus external, global versus specific causes, and stable v. temporary causes. And this may be outside of your awareness, by the way, and probably is. If the way you tend to explain negative events is global, internal, and stable, when that arose, you may tend to think, this is my fault, I'm no good at this kind of work, stable, and I'll never be any good at this kind of work. Imagine how that person might react to that unwanted event if the way they tended to explain negative events was global, internal and stable. And now let's think about the other way, uh, or one other way of reacting, which is to think external. What's their problem that they should talk to me like this? Specific. Sure, it wasn't a very good report, but I handled that difficult telephone call. I sorted out the finances. I arranged this. I did that. And temporary. 
Yeah, it's a skill. It's a know-how thing. No one told me there was a report template on the shared drive. I'll get better at report. I'll get better tomorrow morning at creating a report. How might that person react to the same uh, situation or event? And it may be you feel that having a temporary external specific explanatory style may be better in terms of health and well-being and performance. So I'd encourage you and I encourage others to try to avoid the three P's. So when something bad happens or you find yourself in a bad situation, try not to see the cause as personal, try not to see the cause as permanent and try not to see the cause as pervasive. So think instead, this isn't my fault or this isn't entirely my fault. Think perhaps that this too will change, this will pass, I can develop my skills, I can cope with this. And think also perhaps that this unwanted event or situation only affects one aspect of your life and not multiple aspects. So consider trying to avoid the three P's when something bad happens to you and that can contribute to resilience and adapting well. It can also be helpful to learn how to reframe and think differently about the situation. So uh, Epictetus, uh, a Roman philosopher, formerly a slave, said it's not what happens to man which upsets him, but the view he takes of things. And Epictetus was a, a Stoic philosopher. And one of the characters in the Shakespeare play said nothing is good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So for hundreds of thousands of years, we've known that it's not what happens to people that upsets them in the main, it's the way they think about what happens to them. And certainly if you wanted to go into more detail about the skills and techniques that may help you reframe and think differently about your situation and which may help you become more resilient and less disturbed over time, I'd recommend the Mind Over Mood book by Dennis Greenberger and Christine Podesky. So here are some tips for staying resilient or becoming more resilient over time. So get better at managing stress and anxiety. And I'll share some ideas around how to do that in another presentation. Certainly develop and strengthen friendships and social connections, a very important buffer against stress and adapting poorly to stress. Learn to reframe bad things that happen to you and avoid the three P's and we've explored that a little bit. Find ways to develop and strengthen meaning and purpose in your life or find uh, deeper sources of meaning and purpose. Find ways to improve your general health and fitness levels so we know that improved cardiovascular fitness and strength can help buffer against some of the effects of uh, unwanted stress. Invest in and make sure you get enough sleep and good quality sleep because having poor sleep is an upstream determinant of a wide range of different problems, including frustration and stress. Learn about and use strengths of character. So there's a website I'll post a link to, which can help you uh, get a deeper understanding of what's right with you, not what's wrong with you. And finding ways to use your strengths more often can help with at being resilient and adapting well in the face of adversity. Certainly take steps to cultivate positive emotions and well-being because experiencing positive emotions seems to wash out some of the effects of negative emotions and having high levels of well-being can also contribute to being resilient and adapting well. Cultivate your compassionate mind including self-compassion because sometimes we're very harsh with ourselves and we have a harsh inner critic that can make things worse. And so learning to treat ourselves with the same kindness, acceptance and non-judgment that we might treat someone else who is struggling can be profoundly helpful. And then there are three mindfulness skills that you may wish to explore developing. One is called diffusion or getting some distance from uh, unhelpful thoughts. Another is acceptance and being willing to have unwanted emotions and feelings rather than trying to block them out because emotions and feelings come and go. They're not going to kill you and you can probably make space for them and allow them while acting in harmony with your values. And that can be profoundly helpful 
in terms of moving forward to your best possible life. And then there's another mindfulness skill, because mindfulness isn't one thing, and that's the skill of present moment awareness or presence. So let's dive into these three mindfulness skills in a little bit more detail. So the mind wanders, the mind's a bit of a time traveller. When it wanders into the future, that can be associated with feelings of stress and anxiety. And when it wanders to the past, that can be associated with feelings of guilt or shame, sadness and regret. So present moment awareness is the skill of bringing yourself back to the present moment, to the here and now, and doing that time and time again. And connecting with immediate experience from a range of different senses. Diffusion is about getting some distance from your thoughts, noticing thoughts and seeing thoughts as things which come and go, and learning to unhook from thoughts. And so that reduces the influence of your thoughts on your behaviour. And then this third aspect of mindfulness, acceptance, is being willing to have unwanted thoughts and feelings. Not wanting to, but being willing to have them. Allowing them to rise and be present and fall over time. Looking at certain unwanted feelings and emotions with an attitude of curiosity and acceptance, rather than trying to block them out. And recognising that painful feelings may be uncomfortable, but they're not going to kill you. And as I mentioned, acceptance is not the same as wanting these feelings. So I'd like to invite you to dive a little bit further into the mindfulness skill of present moment awareness. And as I've mentioned, the mind is a time traveller. And this present moment awareness is bringing yourself back to the here and now, time and time again. And three short little exercises you might do throughout the day might be to drop anchor, take 10 breaths and notice five things. And as I say, you can use these periodically throughout the day, which may help um, de-stress temporarily and help your day go better. So I'd like to thank Russ Harris for this content. And I'll now just guide you through these exercises if that's something you'd like to do. And this will only take a couple of minutes and there'll be a downloadable recording accompanying this presentation should you wish to use this into the future. So first of all, and I'm going to do this as I speak, let's drop anchor. So plant your feet firmly onto or into the floor and push them down gently. Notice the floor beneath you, supporting you and feeling solid. And maybe notice any sensations or muscle tension in your legs as you gently push them down. And maybe now notice your entire body and the feeling of gravity throwing through your head and your spine and your trunk and legs down to your feet. It's feeling quite connected and grounded. And now maybe just look around you. And notice what you can see and hear about you. Notice where you are and what you're doing. So having dropped anchor, let's progress to taking 10 breaths. So take 10 slow, deep breaths. Don't force a rhythm, but let yourself settle into a, a nice rhythm of breathing. Maybe slow down the out breath to perhaps four or five seconds. And allow your lungs to refill by themselves. Notice any sensations associated with your lungs emptying and filling. Perhaps notice your tummy moving back and forth. Your rib cage rising and falling. Perhaps your shoulders changing position as you breathe in and out. And allow your thoughts to come and go as they please. Like cars driving past your house. And now expand your awareness from your breathing to your body. 
and noticing what's happening in the space around you to what you can hear and see smell, touch or otherwise feel and on to another way to contact the present moment which is to notice five things so gently pause and look around you and notice five things that you can see and perhaps pay unusual attention to them and now listen carefully and notice five things that you can hear And now notice five things that you can feel in contact with your body. Perhaps anything on your feet, or pressure from your seat, or your back on the chair. Or if you're outdoors, any wind on your face, the clothes on your skin. And now perhaps do all of these simultaneously, paying attention to the senses coming into your body, touch, hearing and seeing. So those are three different ways to contact the present moment. So in summary and conclusion, resilience is very much about being flexible and adapting well to adversity. It's not about bouncing back. And human beings are generally resistant, but obviously we can all become overwhelmed and quite upset by the situation we may find ourselves in, the behavior of other people and certain events we've experienced. Your level of resilience is determined by things both inside you and outside you, and also by your early learning and some early environments. So please don't blame yourself for not being as resilient as you wish, because it's very much not your fault. Having difficulty coping does not make you weak, and we all struggle and we all make mistakes. And while it may not be our fault for finding ourselves in the situations we do and reacting the way we do, it very much is our responsibility to perhaps do something about it. And there are several things we might do to increase our resilience and our ability to manage and adapt in the face of stress and adversity over time. And no one can do these things for you, but many people can help you. And we hope you find some of the information in these presentations helpful.